I had a conversation with a game warden over the last couple of years and he told me a story about a couple of deer poachers that went missing one cold winter night. He gave me a few details that I thought were interesting. And the story you're about to hear is how I think it might have gone. Matter of fact, I'm pretty sure it went down this way. All right, here we go. Ford pulled onto the dirt field road. The driver looked down to make sure he wasn't cornering a ditch. This was no place to get stuck. They already had a big doe in the bed of the truck and he didn't need anyone stopping by to offer help. Not that it would have been a big deal. They could have told anyone that noticed the deer that they had killed it earlier in the day. The pair had watched the field for the last hour and no traffic had come from either direction on the county road where they were parked. It was time to get in there and see what was feeding in the massive bean field in front of them. The driver thumped a cigarette into the darkness and partially rolled his window up. It was cold outside, but they were roasting in that cab. He had meant to fix his heater, but he hadn't had time. He made a mental note to fix it before the summer. He stopped dropped the transfer case into the lowest gear, and released the clutch. There was no need to press the accelerator. The truck would idle to their destination in this gear. The headlights were turned off, but they could see the road clearly under the cloudless full moon. Lights would alert anyone within eyesight that a truck was moving into a field where it should not be. At 2 a.m. on a night that was forecast to be 15 degrees, they doubted anyone would be out anyway. They were safe to do their thing, and they both relaxed. Just another easy night of spotlighting deer. There was no money in poaching deer. There never had been, and Eddie, the driver, wondered why they still did this. He couldn't remember a time when they were not breaking game laws. His father had done it for years, and it was all Eddie knew. Sitting in a cold deer stand all morning was not his idea of a fun morning. He liked venison, and they usually ate everything they killed. Tonight was the first time he had thought about it in this way. If he was forced to explain to someone why he only took wild game illegally, he wouldn't be able to make his case. They both had jobs and could afford groceries. It would have been understandable if they were poor and hungry, it was just something they did, and neither men knew why. These strange thoughts bothered Eddie for the first time in his life, but he quickly brushed the thoughts aside and continued to watch the muddy road ahead of him. They had a long way to go to get to the river bottoms where the trees started. That is where the deer would be, just out from the trees feeding in the cut bean field, and the truck rumbled forward. The passenger, Donnie, never said a word. He sat in his spot, rifle between his legs with the barrel pointed to the floor. The butt of the rifle reached the top of his small frame. The wiry 50-year-old redneck had sat in this spot on many nights on expeditions just like this. He was an old pro. Donnie reached into his pocket and pulled a cool filter king from his shirt pocket, cupped his hand, and lit up. Eddie, five years younger than Donnie, looked over as he lit the smoke and took note of Donnie's gray and leathered face. You know, you could stand to drink some water now and then. It would do you some good and iron out all those wrinkles in your face, Eddie said, laughing. I can't stand the taste of water. We've had this discussion before. Coffee and Mountain Dew gets me by just fine, Donnie said as he hacked up something from deep in his chest. That rattled cough had been with Donnie for two years now, Eddie thought. He probably already had lung cancer. Some of the coughing fits would last for minutes, and Eddie suggested Donnie see a doctor, but that never happened. Donnie would tell him it's just a chest cold. 
Lately, Eddie would tell him he had the longest chest cold in human history, and they would both laugh. There was something wrong, and Donnie knew it. He didn't want to hear the bad news, so he avoided the doctor visit. Donnie rolled his window down a little more to let the clouds of smoke out, the cold air circulated through the cab, and the mud popping the ice breaking under the weight of the truck gave them both a sense of security that Eddie had the right vehicle and tires for this type of work. If they stayed on this road, they would not get stuck. The tree line of the river timber was coming into view under the bright moon. The silhouette of the dormant and leafless trees gave Donnie the creeps at night. It had been that way since he was a little boy poaching with his father. When he was small, he heard stories of monsters that lived in those woods. Even hunting in there during the day made him afraid, but the darkness made it worse. The fear had never left him, but he had never seen anything unusual, so he shook it off. Eddie slowly pressed the clutch and brake together, and the truck came to a stop. He turned the key off, and they sat there in the darkness with the windows open, and they waited. They needed to let everything settle down before they began their light search of the tree line. Eddie finally asked, Why do we keep doing this? It's what we do, boy. It's what we do, Donnie replied. After a few seconds of silence, Eddie took a long draw off of his cigarette and said, Yeah, but someday this is all going to catch up with us. There's no money in this, and the older I get, the less I want to kill. And if we get caught, the fine is going to be hard to pay. We might even have to go to jail if we can't pay it. Donnie said, Look, they just keep adding game laws to the books so that it's impossible for guys like us to hunt. Neither man had hunted legally in their lives, much less buy a hunting license. However, they did buy a license on various occasions when the game wardens were cracking down on hunters. They traveled the roads with deer in their trucks for years and no one ever said a word. Then they started getting stopped and checked. The only thing they could do was buy a license and say they had killed the deer that day. All the more reason in Donnie's mind to keep killing deer at night. But the game wardens had gotten so strict that the poachers had resorted to killing the deer in the fields, and instead of harvesting the whole animal, they would cut the back straps out of their kills and leave the rest of the carcass for the predators. And Donnie went on, All the land is getting leased out to doctors and corporate tycoons. You can't even hunt private land around here anymore. And the rules pile up on public land even more than on private land. Permits and rules and all that crap. If a man wants deer meat, this is the way to do it. We ain't never been caught, and it ain't gonna happen tonight, Eddie. Let's get out and shine those woods. They both slowly opened the truck doors and slid out onto the muddy road. Donnie walked to the driver's side and took in the odors of the hot engine as he passed the front grill. Standing a few feet away from the truck in silence for a minute, they listened. They heard nothing. Donnie raised the spotlight and flipped it on. The field lit up like a baseball game. It took a minute for their eyes to adjust, but they could clearly see several deer a short distance away. I don't want any of those big old bucks. That meat is too tough. Just kill the young does, Donnie said in a low voice. And he did his best to hold the light steady while Eddie raised his rifle. Looking through the cheap Bushnell scope, Eddie saw more than 20 deer standing only 80 to 100 yards away and close to the woods. He scanned the herd and picked out a young doe. He squeezed the trigger. Always louder at night than in daylight, the concussion of the report jolted their chest. Fire spit from the end of the rifle, leaving small sparks close in to fall to the ground. Another round was loaded and another shot shook the still night air. One deer dropped where it stood and the second ran into the woods, either missed or crippled. The herd stayed where it was, looking intently in the direction of the noise that had come from. Twenty deer stood staring at the two men, still, and it was a target-rich scene. Try to drop them in the field. I ain't going into those wood and track those cripples, Donnie said through a cigarette clench between his teeth. 
Eddie nodded and raised the scope to his eye again. He picked out a large doe closest to the poachers and was about to send another 30 alt 6 round into the herd when every deer standing in front of them suddenly bolted back towards the woods. Eddie tried to track one of them in his scope. It didn't matter at this point, and he pulled the trigger again. What spooked those deer, Eddie asked. I guess they winded us, I don't know, Donnie said, and he turned back towards the truck to unload the four-wheeler that would take them to the one deer they had killed. When he raised his head to find the truck, he saw a set of headlights come on and a truck engine start out at the county road they had traveled to get there. It was turning onto the field road and it was moving fast. Then another truck started in the distance to his right. It had to be a mile away, but it was coming right at them. We've got company. We gotta go, Donnie yelled back at Eddie. Eddie turned and saw both vehicles headed their way. It had to be the game wardens. Everything had finally caught up to them. Eddie ran to the back of the truck and reached under the fender wells on the back side of each side of the truck and ripped the taillight wires out. If he started the truck, they would be able to follow the red lights. Jumping into the cab, he quickly started the engine and began moving. Eddie was working through the low gears. He wished he had had time to shift into four-wheel drive high, but there was no time. He said, there's a ditch down this road. It's washed out, and their trucks can't get through it, but I think I can make it. If we can get into those woods, they won't find us. We might have to spend the night out there, but I can't think of anything else. Get us to those woods, boy, Donnie said as he looked back through the rear glass. He estimated it would take them 10 minutes to catch up, and they had not even seen them yet. And with no running lights, they had a chance. When the game wardens got to that spot, there would not be anything to see. Maybe some fresh tire tracks, but there is no way they could get through that ditch Eddie was about to cross. That ditch was their only hope. The road grade started to slope downhill, and Eddie slowed. He dropped to the lowest gear and went straight into the gully and let the truck do its work. The front bumper hung on the far bank, but with a little nudge from the gas pedal, the truck pushed through it, and they were now moving again. At that point, the rear bumper hung on the ledge as the rear end lowered and the truck stopped. Now they were stuck. Donnie mumbled, we're screwed. Not yet, said Eddie. Do you see all that brush on the banks of the ditch? We are lower than that stuff. They won't be able to see the truck unless they drive right up on us. Maybe they won't make it this far. Let's get in the woods. They both exited the cab and dropped into the water below. The truck was hung there, and it would take a crane or a tractor to get them out. Eddie would worry about that later. They just needed to get to the woods. The water in the ditch had soaked them both. Crawling out of the bank, Donnie went into a coughing fit. The rattle in his chest sounded horrible to Eddie. Reaching down, Eddie pulled Donnie to the top of the ditch, and the coughing continued. Between coughs and gags, Donnie wheezed out a few words. Go, go, I'll catch up. We got time, Eddie said. Catch your wind. It'll be ten minutes if they even make it back here this far. Donnie nodded and tried his best to suppress the coughs. Eddie stood up and looked to the area they had just come from. He could see headlights, but they were still way off. Obviously, they were having trouble with the mud and the ice, or they didn't know where the outlaws had gone. He looked back at Donnie, who seemed to be coughing a bit less. Can you move now? Eddie asked. Donnie nodded, and they started moving into the Hatchie River bottoms. The woods were only a few yards away, and they would find a good spot to hold up for the night. The timber was flooded in places, and the area they ran to was in a foot of water covered with ice. Water poured into their boots and soaked their pants with fresh, cold slush. Donnie mumbled, This sucks. It sure does, said Eddie. Not too far, and we should find some dry ground. But they had farther to go than Eddie thought. There was a small knoll that was out of the water that had been left by tracks from a single large piece of equipment. They stopped there to rest and gather their wit, to see where they were and where they could go. Eddie didn't want Donnie to go into another coughing fit, and he still believed they had time. 
Briars and vines had impeded their progress to this point, but where they sat, the woods opened up. They had made it to the bottomland canopy where little grew under the large oaks and cypress trees, which shaded the forest floor during the summer. The moonlight shined through the bare limbs above and produced a creepy scene to the two men. Donnie, already wary of those river bottoms, was overtaken with an ominous sense of dread. We don't need to go deeper into these woods. We'll be able to see their lights on the road if they make it this far back, and if they do, we're screwed anyway. We might as well give up and come out, because if we stay here all night, we're going to freeze to death, said Donnie. I think you're right, Eddie said. Let's sit tight and see what happens. Eddie reached into his pocket to find a small mag light he always carried for field butchering their illegal kills. Panning the woods, he got a better sense of their surroundings. He saw a movement to his right and quickly moved the beam of light back to that spot. Laying there in the water was a crippled deer. He had hit one and not killed it earlier. The deer laid on its side with its head held high out of the water to keep from drowning. With the light in its eyes and the scent of men now close, the deer began to move frantically, kicking water and trying to get up but it wasn't possible. Eddie figured there must have been some spinal damage and the deer was paralyzed. Blood poured from the deer's stomach and colored the freezing water surrounding the animal. A sense of compassion came over Eddie while he watched the deer struggle. How many deer had he killed this way? How many had he crippled and left to die in agony just like this one? Remorse filled his senses as he watched the young buck slowly lose its strength from the shock and lower its head into the water where it would drown. And then the deer was still. Ripples of water seeped onto the ice that had formed around the deer since it stopped there. The ice was red with blood, one set of antlers, and an ear was all that was left visible out of the water now. If I can get out of this, I will never do this again, Eddie said, looking over at the deer. I'm done with being an outlaw poacher. I always thought it was cool and the easy way to get meat, but it's cruel and not fair to the animals. This is our last time to spotlight, Donnie. Probably so, Donnie said in a low voice. I see headlights coming up on the truck. Looks like they made it this far back. Turn that light off before they see us. Eddie switched the light off and watched the truck approach the turn where the ditch was washed out. But before the truck turned the corner, it stopped. They heard the doors of the truck open and shut, and spotlights filled the field, panning back and forth. They were looking for the poachers, but in the wrong place. If they had come another few yards and made a short turn, they would have seen Eddie's truck. If this was as far as they were coming, then the outlaws might have a chance. Eddie glanced back over at the deer, and he could see in the moonlight more remorse, more regret. He just needed to get out of this ordeal, and he was done with this outlaw life. The light panned their way, and both men rolled backwards to get close to the ground. They laid flat in the water using the knoll to shield them from view. The beam of light shined over them several times, and they heard men talking at the edge of the woods several feet away. But the men stopped there and would not come closer. Eddie figured they knew poachers had rifles, and none of those men wanted to get shot. Soon, the men retreated, and the outlaws heard doors slam. Eddie thought, now, if they will just turn around and go back, we can make it out of this thing. And that is exactly what the game wardens did. The poachers watched the red tail lights drift into the darkness until there was no sound. After laying still in that icy water for several minutes, the men stood up shivering and miserable. Do you think that's it? Donnie asked. They're gone, said Eddie. They don't want to be out in this cold any more than we do. We won't see them again. And he moved back on the mound and out of the water. Eddie shined his light back over to the deer to get one more look at what he had been doing to animals his whole life. He wanted that image to stick in his mind, but the deer was gone. Just five minutes before, he could see half the rack and the bloody side of the deer that had just died. Steam was even coming off the carcass. 
but now there was nothing. That deer's gone, Eddie said, never looking at Donnie. I don't give a damn about that deer, boy. Let's get back to your truck and warm up with your broken heater, said Donnie. There's no way that deer got up and ran off, Eddie said. It was dead. I still don't care, boy. We got to get warm. Come on, let's get moving. Just then, a low growl came from behind them. Neither man turned to look, but they both heard it. Then the obvious sound of heavy footfalls through ice and water coming their way. Now they both turned and looked. Eddie was shaking with fear. He pulled the light and turned it on. And what they saw was beyond comprehension. Four large creatures standing upright on two legs were moving towards them. The two in the middle lowered themselves to all fours and started running at an incredible speed, while the two on either side moved laterally to each side to flank the pair of outlaw poachers. The rednecks were too stunned to run or to run fast enough. Right about the moment the flight instinct kicked in, the beasts were on them. Screams of terrified men in agony filled the Hatchie River bottoms that night. Soon the woods were silent with only the sounds of four swamp monsters dragging two human bodies and one deer deeper into the forest. The next day, Eddie's truck was discovered wedged between two ditch banks. The game warden searched the truck and found two 30 6 bolt rifles, two Cubine-type spotlights, and other various trash that usually rode with most men who never cleaned their trucks. Tracks in the road and holes recently refrozen in the ice were followed into the woods to a small knoll where they found evidence two individuals had sat for a while. A half pack of cool filter kings was discovered a few feet further on the ice and one boot wedged in a half frozen hole in the ice. It appeared to investigators that large pieces of ice had been broken and moved onto existing ice, and it had all refrozen during the night. Something large had moved through this area, more than one in fact. A few feet away, a blood-soaked area of ice was discovered and samples were collected. Later testing identified the blood as belonging to a deer. No other blood was found in the area. Within two weeks, the ice had thawed during a warm spell and any evidence at this location was washed away. Searchers looked for the two men for two weeks. Local duck hunters and others who owned boats canvassed the river bottoms for any sign of the two, but nothing ever turned up. Families mourned the loss of loved ones and it all blew over. Four years later, during the summer months, a farmer who was clearing more land he owned in the river bottoms for more growing space blew up a series of beaver dams to drain his future cotton fields. The last item to destroy was a large beaver hut, which sat high in the water at the edge of his property. When the smoke and the debris had settled from his control detonation, a faded camouflage jacket drifted slowly in the air and settled on the ground only a few feet from his position. Upon inspection, several items were retrieved from the pockets. A handful of 30 6 Federal bullets, a thick-bladed hunting knife that still had a sharp edge, and a metal Zippo lighter, with a New Orleans Saints emblem glued to the front, a lighter that was later confirmed to belong to Donnie by one of his brothers. It has been 22 years since this incident occurred, and no evidence of the bodies has ever been found.